Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, The Love That Loves You Back, uh, a podcast between myself, Valerie Kabov, and uh, my dear friend, Jonathan Fremantle. Uh, I'm a, an artistic miscreant, uh, otherwise known as a self-described third generation art, art professional, you know, who's currently raising a fourth generation art professional, uh, uh, born in the depths of the Pale of Settlement in the former Soviet Union, and mm. partly raised in Australia, uh, lived and worked in, in London and Paris, and uh, 15 years ago, uh, by a quirk of fate, relocated to Zimbabwe, where I'm the co-founder of First Floor Gallery Harari, trying to figure out um, life education, art, and predominantly love of art as mm. life goes on. And um, w without further ado, over to Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie. Yeah, I'm uh, I, Jonathan Fremantle. I grew up in Cape Town and uh, studied in London. I did a long apprenticeship in uh, fine art in the old old sense and have been more making art in one way or another ever since then. Um, uh, I live in Edinburgh now, but I also lived for a while in Johannesburg where I had Hazard Gallery, and that was the context that I met Valerie about 10, 12 years ago, and uh, just loved the conversation we had immediately about painting and how painting is everything. And uh, that conversation has been a, a constant source of joy and um, sustenance over the years. So it does make sense that we share the conversation and uh, uh, look forward to where this goes. Yeah, no, I mean, we, uh, and it usually goes anywhere and everywhere, but somehow mm -hmm. within, we always come back to art and uh, yeah. because it is the love that loves us back. Thank you right. very much for joining us and we look forward to sharing the journey. So to, uh, today uh, we wanted to talk about uh, exhibitions and uh, as opposed to experience of individual artworks and uh, the idea being to just talk about exhibitions that for this particular sessions were in our conception, perfect exhibitions for us and um, in, in their own way. And the, I, I mean, and an exhibition, uh, I, I treat personally exhibition as an artwork in itself. And I think it's something that I've seen uh, and, and very, very experientially. So in a sense that a conductor conducts an orchestra, uh, that's how I perceive an exhibition being conducted by a curator. And I think that kind of element of practice is often dismissed, you know, in, in the logistic preparations, constructions, but then having a sense of poetry, processionality and awareness of the audience and space is, is what makes it. And uh, um, I mean, how do you, how do you see exhib exhibitions in that context? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, there's, it's storytelling in a way that um, with the main aim being giving you an experience of the painting or sculpture or whatever it is that that is beyond just a kind of linear narrative like he did this then and or she did this then and then that happened and then that happened it's an experience where you come out and you feel changed it somehow changes your inner kind of resonance or connection to that artist and deepens it shows you something new um but also doesn't get in the way of that you know it's it's not the, the academics and the kind of concept is is almost invisible so that your experience is primary um and uh it's actually surprisingly rare you know you think when you put a bunch of rothkos in a room or a bunch of you know incredible artworks in a room or in multiple rooms that that should be enough but it, it turns out it isn't always no it... there's this element but it's also kind of, I, I also feel that understanding an exhibition is uh, is a trained experience as well. It sort of requires certain capacity in the same way that we uh, talk about 
you know, opening a certain doorway to experiencing an artwork and being open to the experience, you know, emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually, rather than demanding an experience. Uh, I find that a lot of audiences, and, and that happens in museums where they walk in, they, you know, people look at an individual artwork and, and that's perfectly valid, but they, you know, they need to be made aware of an, an additional kind of uh, consciousness of experiencing a, a space as a space with artwork in it. And I think implicitly people do do that, but, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of us are preoccupied, you know, with daily concerns I have to get from here to here, then, then you know, oh God, there's this artwork. And there is that tick, you know, ticking boxes yeah. that happens in museums for a lot of people that actually uh, reduces the, or will, you know, almost vitiates the nature of the experience. And so I think that's also something that is really important that museums or exhibition spaces are meditative spaces that, and be you know, and entering a space with art is actually already you know that threshold is already you know an entry into something that is different from the everyday. And so, mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to throw back this that you know you mentioned something being uh, but merely biographical, and I'm like I'm a huge fan of uh, you know biographical exhibitions you know this happened then and that because yeah. that processionality is also if if done well right and, done well, you know if, if, done, if done well and I actually uh so this sort of neatly brings me to the first show that I want to discuss and um it's actually the and it's it's purely a biographical show but it was extraordinary and it's the a uh, first uh, major oh, exhibition, oh, a retrospective for Basquiat that uh, uh, I saw at Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris. And in fact, just doing research, I realized that it was first exhibited at the Baylor Foundation. And I thought, but of course, because Baylor Foundation is like, in my view, probably stages the most perfectly curated exhibitions I've ever seen ever, ever, ever there. I mean, I don't know what gives them that extreme, extreme precision, but this exhibition, um, again, it was in two, uh, 2010. And what makes it interesting is that it preceded a lot of the massive hype for Basquiat that happened subsequently. And maybe it was one of the triggers for it. But what I really loved about that exhibition is that you're looking at the you know, it had more than a thousand works of mm. the artists and that is extraordinary. And that included a lot of drawings. It was, it was excruciatingly expansive where you feel like you're wading through a person's life, but not in a chaotic way, but in a way that just drives you along. And it, you know, with where everything was displayed in a way that led you to the next step without you being able to anticipate what the next step was. And the beauty of that show was that, I mean, apart from being mind blowing that most of the work that he made was in the last three years of his life, that, you know, any artist who uh, by the age of 27 has made more than 2000 works is, yeah. it just, it just drives you bananas to imagine but <laughs> this is even possible, you know, when you talk to any artist and a gallery says, look, you need to make at least 30 works a year to, to have a career, right, to have a manageable career. And, and just to look at that was mind blowing. But also, for me, what was, I mean, it was extremely educational, but, but extra, but more than educational, which is something that a lot of exhibitions try to, you know, attempt is like, let's be didactic. This is what you're supposed to learn. Uh, it was, it was amazingly poetic. So that, and what was, what struck me by the end of that exhibition is that as you arrive into the final room of the show and you see his final paintings, mm -hmm. there is a sense of death in the paintings that was so, entirely evident 
and the paintings because this is an artist who is best known for his, you know, the energy of his paintings, the colors, the brush, the paintings become almost entirely monochrome and overwhelmingly white background uh, to the point where you absolutely see that this is a person who also knew that they were about to die. And, mm -hmm. and you can't explain it, but you become emotionally overwhelmed because you know not only that there is this anticipation of death in the, in the paintings, but also your knowledge that this was actually a reality. And at that and at that point, you reassess the whole exhibition, right? And the manic energy to produce as being an embodied consciousness of how much how little time he actually yeah. had. Because I, you know, I mean, there are a couple of theories of um of talent and you know one of them is a slow burn and the other one's a shooting star and they feel like it's almost like you have a limited amount of genius that is lumped on your head and how you you know and some people get to just put it all out there in you know in a very short period of time and that often applies to music they say like this is you know you're a shooting star this is what you've got you've got to make the most of it and other people just build and build over time and the and there's almost and the no overlap in that mm. you know in that kind of trajectory according to whatever sign I'm sure they'll come up with a better theory but that to me was uh, like I still get emotional when I think about that show because to think that at the age of 27 somebody had had to accumulate all that in terms of practice and get all of that done is like overwhelming because we all remember that what idiots we were at 27, you know, and, uh, and happily, you know, happy idiots, you know, unhappy idiots, messed up idiots who didn't know what we were doing. Right. But this guy did. And, and that's, you know, that's the genius. And I just thought that that show, I mean, like you literally, once he came out of the exhibition, you felt like you were spat out on, you know, by the sea on the shore and you were like, and you're you know you're breathless you know and that's wow. and that's the beauty of the show so over to yeah, you <laughs> so that's huge it's such a gift when someone when a, when something is fragile as genius and as un irrefutable as genius is handled so carefully um i had i think i'll probably the one I'll pick out first would be a show I saw last year at the Esterick Collection, which is a a um, gallery that in London, that's a kind of cultural centre for all things Italian, um, and uh, it's a kind of house really in um, Highbury, you know, North London, um, and it was a show of uh, Giorgio Morandi's work but all from the Magna Rocca collection. I think that's his name. He was this collector who bought, I think, half of the Mirandis out there he owned, <laughs> something like that. Um, and so it's it's all work from his collection, and he consistently collected Mirandis' work throughout his life. Um, and so the it was beautiful to see a specific eye on a on an artist who I love um, and also recognize instantly how much this collector loved the artist. So there was this really, A, from the works he chose, but then they also presented the letters that Mirandi wrote to him saying, more or less saying, sorry, I don't have something for you this month, but I will next month. And uh, no, you can't buy anything yet, but you'll have to wait. And well, so the, isn't that a privilege? <laughs> it's so lovely. This guy's obviously just, just you know, waiting at the door for whatever comes. Um, and the story of how they first connected was lovely. You know, they he he found his work and uh, immediately wanted to buy everything. And Mirandi said, "You can't buy everything, but you can have this." Um, and there was one painting in the whole show. It was a still life with some musical instruments. And I, I, I went up to the picture and looked at it. And there's a little description next to it saying this was a commission from this guy who sent Mirandi some musical instruments to paint. You know, Can you paint these for me? 
And uh, Morani did it, but clearly hated doing it. And the collector clearly recognized how much he hated doing it and felt so bad and so remorseful and apologized profusely and promised never to do that again. And so, A, he recognized that you just don't do that, you know. And B, he kind of understood through that interaction what it was. That relationship obviously deepened, you know. Um, so... That, that's the kind of film that contained the show. Uh, there was this sensitive, tender relationship, and you could really sense how um, a lot of the works were appeared to be slightly unfinished as well. You know, those paintings that, as a painter, you you you're um, nervous to release into the world. You know they're done, but in that last moment before presenting them to the world or the gallery or whatever it is, you you do something else which finishes them and and quite often destroys that that fragile, wondrous energy. And I think maybe because of this relationship, he was able to to present them to this guy in that moment before they got overdone. Or maybe the so, dude just snatched them. <laughs> snatched yeah, them. well, it's possible. Said, no, but, no, I want this, though, you know. <laughs> It's possible, although I I doubt it. I think there was something there. There was some kind of trust where, yes. <laughs> where he knew he could look after them. And they were, I mean, the 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 knockout painting for me, even though obviously I love all of his these collections of objects, which in the, it's a very small space, so there are only four rooms, um, and one of the rooms was entirely drawings, which is a miraculous room. You know, these thin drawings and. Um, and um, you, there was a kind of narrative of time, so you kind of ascend to the later paintings. But um, the kind of main room had uh, some of the knockout still lives, and then it had this painting of uh, this, this rose. And I'd never seen a flower painting by Mirandi, and I just started crying. <laughs> and it was a very small space, and there were all these Italian people working there you know and uh i think because they're italian they they were totally fine with this expression of emotion and they kind of looked at me like yeah yeah yeah, yeah you get it <laughs> um so yeah it sort of felt like a family i was in a in someone's house you know this collector's house and i was being shown around ushered around and seeing his beautiful things which he had left there he has a there's a foundation obviously now in Italy where you can see all the work, um, and uh, like you said, I I left I I came out of the show, uh, like I was walking on air, you know, and, and everything was the color was, everything was richer, the colors looked richer, the people's faces I could see I remember the rosy cheeks of this lady, on the bus that looked like the color of the flower. You know, it, it it didn't so much hit me in the face. It I could feel the work entering into me while I was standing in the room. And I knew that this experience would be kind of seeping out for the rest of my life. Um, and uh, it, it, it still is. You know, there's still moments where that show comes back and it's like, oh, wow, that's it's in me. It's not out there. It's not a thing that had happened in time that I can refer to. It's actually became part of my body, um, and I'm sure it's part in part because of the way it was shown and presented, and and um, quite restrained. It wasn't a kind of salon hang, you know. There was there was enough, but not too much, you know. All, all of those factors really helped, um, and, and I kind of wish it was always there, you know, that I could go and see it every week. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's that's a kind of well, it is always there in your in your it mind. Is. It's now yeah. it's now there, you know, and you can enter into that room. And yeah. yeah, no, it's beautiful because I've seen I saw a lovely, lovely, lovely Morandi show um at Palazzo Real uh, in Milan a couple of years ago, and they where they recreated his studio. Um yeah in the and and in a video like 
you know, video projections. And I've seen a few exhibitions now which incorporate uh, that kind of uh, projecting the space into and it was lovely what they did is they restaged the studio and you could sit um you could sit and watch uh sun sunrise to sunset in the studio which was like quite special i i thought it was really sweet because you could see how the light changed so they tried to recreate the space so that yeah. you can uh, get an idea and i saw actually at musée de la rangerie in in Paris, also last year, Modigliani show about his relationship with a collector, where they restaged the actual uh, hang of the works in the collector's apartment, which which is actually touching. It's uh, you know it makes things tangible that, and that's lovely. Yeah, that yeah. and I, it's also the, it's often the um, I saw an image of a painting by. So I was interviewed ages ago and they asked if you had 5,000, 50,000 and 500 dollars, what would you, what artworks would you buy? And I said, I think I said with 50,000, I would pay uh, some thieves to go and steal Julian Barnes's Howard Hodgkin because I know where it's hanging. <laughs> I've seen some images and it's, it's hanging in... Um, his hallway and it's this orange beautiful probably my favorite Howard Hodgkin painting uh it's hanging on the right just as you can it's hanging on the right <laughs> just <laughs> and, um, but uh, it really is it's beautiful it's sort of like you wouldn't imagine a Howard Hodgkin just on the hallway as you come into a normal London house but there it is and it looks so beautiful there you almost the only reason I wouldn't steal it is that it's perfect there. Yeah, they did I'm... a they did recreate Brancusi's studio in that Brancusi show that I think we both saw at the the Pompidou recently. It was astonishing to see all the work together, and the Pompidou is incredible, and the juxtapositions with the skyline of Paris and the Sacre Coeur and these these birds in flight and all, um, and. Uh, and then they set up the studio and and actually what that made me think was i was i would rather have seen that studio you know how they have his studio recreated and they'd closed that so that they could recreate it in this exhibition and the way that they recreated it was a little bit like those you know in the museums of natural history where they kind of create a vignette like this is how the neanderthals lived you know and they have like a fake this is how brain koozie lived <laughs> And, yeah, and it, it looked like that, and it <clears throat> it was really wrong. I tried to get into it because those were those are his tools, and and um, but it, it 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 wasn't right. It was, and it kind of even though it was amazing to see all the work, and 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 I do, um, I, I though a lot of those works hit me in a way that I still haven't even finished working out. Um, the the presentation, particularly in that the kind of archival stuff and how he photos of him in his studio and so on, it was done in a way that felt like yeah. yeah. But oh, yeah. I also think yes. it's uh, but it just it's also you removing you know recreating the space is you can't transpose the spirit of the play the space that's and and if, I mean I'll 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 actually it reminds me of a, like almost the directly opposite experience uh, of visiting Rembrandt's studio, completely uh. bereft you know in the Rembrandt house, completely bereft of all the works, but just stepping into the room, mm. I was so overwhelmed that I started hyperventilating and I had to sit down on the floor because I was just entirely overwhelmed because the place carried everything. And also I, I recognized the room, right? You know, and it was the room that made the made the experience without any art whatsoever. Like the art was already inside me, you know, all the things that I needed to know, all of the art made there was there and it was entirely palpable in that room. I literally, it was ridiculous also uh, that, you know, like with your uh, cry, I was 
like I had to I had to sit down because I just couldn't breathe wow. inside the room. I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to sit on the floor. <laughs> this is what's happening now. And because it, it just my mind was entirely blown. That whole space was just talking to me. It was and it was entirely without any art whatsoever. And I think that was also perfectly curated as an experience because to leave the space for engagement, you know, and also understanding that your audience already knows the artist and knows knows the work. That is also sometimes not having art in the room is the art, right? And that's uh, and that's also kind of a beautiful curated moment. It's <laughs> that was I, I still yeah, and that and that sort of is exactly the opposite. But it also makes me think that. Uh, we are so used to experiencing art in white cubes now, and yet we, you know, and these experiences are outside the white cube. They're more tangible and poignant. And and how do we? And at the same time, I'm a huge fan of the white cube as as an ex, as a neutral exhibition, you know, experience. It's yeah. sort of, it's such a push and pull for me to think about uh, to think about what is you know. I guess every exhibition requires its own space but I think ultimately an exhibition is beyond a white cube whereas art presentation is you know amplified in a white cube. you know I don't know that's it's sort yeah. of what comes tell, out tell me about, because you you mentioned you wanted to talk about that Anselm Kiefer show and and it occurs to me that just as you're talking about the white cube and what to do with the white cube how he's he destroyed this white cube you know he made a he, he kind of made it into one of his mind caves, you know. Um, and you wanted to talk about it, Anselm yeah. Kiefer show, which might yeah. be it, it might be interesting to kind of contrast those. I well, I mean, the show that I wanted to talk about Anselm Kiefer was his Monumenta show. Hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, was in the Grand Palais, I think, in twenty eleven, and it totally blew my mind because the Monumenta projects while they were running and they were extraordinary and every show that I've seen there was extraordinary. I mean, Christian Boltanski and Anish Kapoor, but uh, Anselm Kiefer for me was the most incredible because of the, uh, the project required the artist to take over the Grand Palais in Paris entirely. And that's an exquisitely huge space for a single presentation and and to conceive of it as a single project is overwhelming and what and so when you walk into that exhibition and you walk he puts sand on the floor area so you, you kind of walk in you're already in an altered space right and you see you know constructions that are your typical Lancel Kiefer you know bunkers and everything and but because the space is so large, you have to kind of, you know, it's processional, you're kind of moving in there, but there is no particular path that you should be taking and none is indicated. And at a certain point, you're aware of other people doing the exact same thing. And mm -hmm. at, at like several, like about 10 to 15 minutes later, I realized that I was part of the artwork and that mm -hmm. me seeing other people engaging with the space was entirely the design and that you are in fact you are a hundred percent unequivocally an anticipated randomized participant in the actual exhibition and it's again it's not just the uh you know the constructions those are just you know like catalysts for you know and almost like you're in a pinball in a sense like in a very sort of randomized um slowed down pinball you know mm -hmm. suspended in light everything was because uh grand palais has you know the glass uh roof everything is extraordinary amounts of light uh beaming down in this 19th century building but at the same time you're having a legacy you know you're in some kind of a desert uh, with the legacy of World War II, which is all of uh, Kiefer's sort of over is somehow centered on that experience. And it's desolated. It's almost post-life. I mean, in every way, post-life, because this, the 19th century is, is not the present. Uh, World War II is not the present. There is a desert, you know, of feeling. And then you're just wandering through it. And it's it's all it becomes almost biblical in that sort of experience yeah. that 
and you're looking at other people uh, at a certain point and you say, do they realize also that, that you know that they're part of the artwork and you know because you say, and you think oh me seeing other people is what makes the work you know the sort of us being ants also because you are so dwarfed by the space so dwarfed and being aware of being dwarfed is seems to be almost the the crux of the whole experience and right. yeah and and that was the perfection, right? That everything was crystallized, you know, into one singular experience that was, in fact, not processional at all, right? It yes. was, it, it was, you know, how to crystallize the event into one single moment that is everything at the same time compressed and expressed, and that was that was extraordinary because there's not a single part of the installation that was more important than the other or more interesting or was it, it was it was the totality or it was nothing and and that's uh and that's what made it a perfect exhibition you know unfortunately we haven't yeah. discussed any exhibitions that involve more than one artist at this stage but that's our I mean but tell me what he did at white cube to destroy the uh, white cube. <laughs> well yeah I I mean I went I went prepared to be astonished because I love his work. Oh, I love his work. I'm kind of overwhelmed by his work, you know. Um, and the White Cube in uh, Bermondsey, I think. Uh, it's like, you know, it's a vast space. And um, and he's he forced it into another realm. You know, he the central corridor, which leads into all the rooms, these big rooms, he turned into this kind of, like you're in the archive of some, some ancient bar library where, where all these artifacts are stacked all the way to the ceiling on these shelves. And the artifacts were kind of those lead books and, uh, and bits of sculpture and bottles of things and it really is a kind of as if you found the kind of national library of some civilization that's crumbled and then um and it's and the, the amount of lead you know in a, i think it has an, an energy it sort of an emits a kind of charge which is very low frequency so your, your whole body feels heavy and um and then each room he had altered completely altered you know in that way where I never saw Oliver Eliasson's river, but, you know, when he made a river flow through a gallery, you know, the, the, it felt it was in that area where the it's, it's like a kind of stage for some epic film that, that you've just stumbled on. Um, and the final room had this big kind of pile of rubble, concrete rubble, and then these huge World War II artworks with planes, you know, the ones... And then in the rubble, there were these kind of dead the sunflowers that he uses a lot, that kind of hanging on their sad, sad, sad sunflowers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and th at that point, I kind of, it sort of broke for me because the experience was so powerful. And then suddenly I just saw it as stage props. Somehow, because it was in a white cube space, uh, by the time I got to the last room, I kind of, I, I understood what was happening. These were props, you know, that these and and it that fucked me up a bit because it, it instead of it being an art exhibition, I felt like I was I was uh I kind of saw the device, you know, that these were just kind of fake objects. <laughs> so in the end it kind of left me um uh with this strange feeling of having seen the trick you know like i understood what he was doing and that that kind of it slightly fucked me up because instead of it feeling like i was looking at artwork it looked like i was looking at a kind of stage set a film set and then then you have to i had to leave the exhibition through this corridor and i had that same experience that you had which was I got it that we were the artworks you know we were like he it is a film set you know he had set the stage of this dystopian place and these people that were walking through it kind of discombobulated and and confused and 
overwhelmed and we, we were it, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, to be honest, I don't think I fully understood that until you you related your experience just there, you know, that, that um, and that experience didn't finish when I left, left the gallery. You know, London is pretty dystopian you know, in some ways. And you see billboards and you see all these kind of artifices of of kind of rampant capitalism and and um and that kind of line between the white cube gallery space with all this lead and the world out there, it stayed with me. It's it's still with me. You know, that's maybe the the what a good show is. It's that show that doesn't leave when you leave the space. Just to go back to Kiefer's like it's almost taking and then I think he's an artist who is at the you know he's at that acme of his practice where he can do whatever he wants but it's also crystallized the fact that an artwork is a pretext for an experience yeah. it's 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 that sounding board it's not an end in itself and I think it's uh, and and you as the audience are absolutely crucial to that communication whether you know usually uh in individually not um uh not on mass as you would be in mm. music, but that, uh, but that definitely is, you know, the object is only, is only an opportunity, you know, and a catalyst in some, a magical catalyst in some way, but yeah. a catalyst nonetheless. Yeah. So the uh, artwork being a uh, touchstone. And I think, uh, and I think that's what a perfect exhibition does is create mm. that overall experience, an experience in itself. Yeah kind of window into um, uh, a new way to experience not just the work, but it somehow alters your own experience of yourself, your body. The um, the feeling of being in presence with the work, it kind of gets to you before your mind's got there. Yeah. You, know, you spoke earlier about uh, the show being just ahead of you you know things were happening before you thought they would happen and um it's 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 often like that where where um i mean I, i'll briefly touch on this the Cezanne show that changed my life when i was 17 you know i'd never been seen really original work i grew up in south africa and i was in london age 17 Cezanne was my guy and I was given tickets to the private view of this major retrospective, 1996, at the Tate. And um, everyone was drinking champagne. It was the opening. I was on my own. I, it was my teacher who had given me his ticket, you know, because he couldn't go. And firstly, I was astonished that no one was really looking at the work. Um, and I felt a little bit like maybe Suzanne would have felt as a kind of provincial southerner who'd come to the north where everyone was wearing suits and and not really getting it, you know. Um, and I was a kid, but I was walking around from room to room and all of the big, these major works that I'd never seen in the flesh were there and they were hitting me. But I, the, the experience that left as the, the deepest impression on me was I turned a corner into a room and the way this painting was placed was a small painting of just green grass and some green trees. And it was a kind of early landscape, but it was the beginning of what became what he became. And it was hung in a way that you knew they knew that this was the start of it all. And you turn the corner and you see it. And it, I got him, like I got what he was doing. I got where he came from. And um, I was almost like parallel. I don't think I like a deer in the headlights being locked into this kind of radio signal from this this artwork, um, and it was definitely the way it was presented. It was just there as you turned the corner, um, and uh, I, I've been striving to achieve that whenever I hang a show of my work. You know, a I'm trying to not overhang it, which is the great impossible task to not put everything in. And B, you know, to create these views of works from other rooms, you know, where you you see a work, it's like, oh, I've, I didn't know that that was coming. You know, it gives you this like hint of what's the next room's promising. Um, and you, you, you're you not ready to see it, but it gives you a glimpse. Um, and uh, when that's done well, it's, it's, it's like electric. Your body's like Rice Krispies starts popping. <laughs> but, and that's the other thing is that, uh, so much of art is uh, 
has been or oh, perceptionally reduced to being residing in the eyes and brain, you know, that eye brain connection. And yet an exhibition is something that actually uh, locates your whole body in in the space and in the experience in a very imperative way you're not just your eyes you're not and and in fact and i think this it's also really uh important to re as a reinforcement that art is an embodied experience it's not just something that lives in your eyes and in your brain is probably the least you know now that we're finding out that brain is probably the least important part of your body <laughs> In, in every conceivable way, you know, if your stomach has brain cells, your spinal cord carries more information, there's, you know, so, so it makes sense and that the information is received through the eyes, but it doesn't get processed or, you know, resolve itself merely in your head. It's, it's, it's an all embodied experience. And I think that's, you know, that's the world we live in. On that note, bye. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs>